Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan the Energy Man, the first show of 2017. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies and my job is to make you as smart as humanly possible with regards to energy. So relax, sit back and pop a cold one. After all, I get it's got to be 5 p.m. someplace around the world. And I look much smarter and sound much smarter after you had a few, so go ahead and pop a cold one, even though it's lunchtime here. We'll find out what the great state of California is doing today to clean up its transportation sector because that's something that we're likewise trying to do here in Hawaii. My guest today is Mr. Tyson Eckerly, who is actually sitting in Governor Jerry Brown's desk right now. Well, maybe he's not, um, but he's over there in Sacramento where in the seat of government, the executive branch. And uh, we're going to be talking to Tyson and finding out what's new in, in California. But just for a side note here, uh, the, the image behind me, what you see behind me is actually from a trip I made to France, a really cool castle over there. So we're kind of doing the show from Hawaii and France all at the same time. But Tyson, thanks for uh, coming on the show with us today. And I really appreciate you being on. We haven't seen each other for a while, but you know, you're my hero over in California. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, we're trying to actually start a, um, a bill in Hawaii that will bring up uh, a position like yours in our executive branch. Uh, and it may end up being me, but we're trying to get somebody who can say, hi, I'm from the governor's office and I'm here to help you uh, with our hydrogen infrastructure. So what do you think? Is that going to work out okay? You like doing that? I think that'd be great, Stan. I think it'd be great to have Sam the energy man in there for sure. And, and um, it's been a really big help here in our, um, in, in, in the state of California. Uh, We've worked a lot with local agencies and it, there's a big difference coming in as a company versus coming in as the governor's office to um, you know pitch and support a project and so really what's what's helped is we've you know worked direct with local agencies and our fire marshals here to set up the systems and and make sure that you know when a project does come in that is you know uh, developing the infrastructure we're trying to develop you know the, the hydrogen fueling stations it gets top priority and top billing within the cities and it's been really effective so far um, it's also been helpful to pull agencies together so within this we have a, a vast array of agencies with a bunch of overlapping jurisdiction and really it's helping to streamline kind of you know where the focus is so we are you know effective with our set of resources and making sure we're doing everything we can to help launch this market so I think it's an excellent idea and I hope it happens well we're gonna we're gonna try it I think the uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum is going to put that initiative in we're gonna we're gonna look at it uh, this week and see what they do but t tell us a little bit about yourself and you know i know you grew up in california so what got you wired into doing uh, what you do now with hydrogen and i mean how, how the heck did you end up all the way at the governor's level uh and being smart enough to answer all the questions and helping the fire marshals uh which through all the permitting issues and things to do stations well i think if anything there's a lot of smart people around and i ask a lot of questions and that's kind of really how it started but i mean if I, you know, going to how, to how I fell into hydrogen is really almost luck. I was down at graduate school at UC Santa Barbara and uh, had met a couple of gentlemen down there who had started a nonprofit called Energy Independence Now that was based in Santa Barbara out of, out of luck and ended up in, interning there. Um, and that organization actually started uh, with, so it was Daniel Emmett, Rick Margolin, and Terry Tamminen. And Terry Tamminen turned out to be, um, they, they put together a pitch uh, for the hydrogen highway in California. They pitched to Governor Schwarzenegger at the time, or um, when he was running for office. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger really liked the idea, and so he, he took that up as one of his main platforms. He brought in Terry Tamminen as the Cal EPA secretary. And so from there, Energy Independence Now became uh, you know, one of those repositories of knowledge and helped push this hydrogen highway blueprint plan. This is before my time. Um, they also pushed through some renewable energy stuff. and so. When I met them, I didn't know anything about hydrogen, but I did know I loved, um, you know, wanted to work on climate change and and air quality. And there's really no better way to do that than to work in the transportation sector. You know, here's we have it's about 40 percent of our emissions profile in, in the state of California, so it's a big, big chunk, the largest, in fact. And so, any strategy to help uh, reduce emissions from the transportation sector is, um, you know, what I was interested in. And then the pathway and you know, it's, it's, I guess a longer story, but when I took over Energy Independence now, um, I think back in 2011 or so, we were looking kind of for how to make an impact. 
And we developed a hydrogen network investment plan, um, working with a bunch of different stakeholders to figure out, okay, what would we do to incentivize the development of hydrogen infrastructure? How would we structure it? And so we came up with a bunch of concepts that were pretty influential um, and helped support the uh, passage of legislation here in California that um, Assembly Bill 8, and there are a lot of stakeholders who worked on that. Um, but Assembly Bill 8 put together um, for hydrogen $20 million a year, and I less it. That's a, a lot of money. And it's nice to have a big state like California to do that, but $20 million a year to build out a network of at least 100 stations. And this is part of the program that does um, all the different alternative fuels. So it's about a $100 million annual program. And so our recommendations got fed into there. Um, one of the things that came out of it was the uh, need for centralized coordination out of the governor's office to help make sure that the hydrogen network is developed in a good manner. And, and so I put my hat into the ring and I uh, was selected by the governor to do that. And that's really kind of a, a nutshell story of how I got here. It's just luck and opportunity and, and uh, being in the right place at the right time. Well, that's awesome. And, uh, you know, we've actually had Terry Tamman in here on our show and uh, did a great interview with him. And I had no idea who I had on the line there until, uh, I mean, he was here in person for the um, World Conservation Congress. So we had him on the show. And as I, because I was just introduced to him as Terry. You know, and then I find out he's head of the DiCaprio Foundation, and he wrote a book that I really, I read and was really inspired by, um, um, Lives Per Gallon, and you know, I, I just went crazy uh, talking to him, and he's a great guy. I hope to have him back on. Uh, he, he uh, again, California guy, grew up in California, and did the uh, like scuba diving, and that's what got him into the clean energy stuff, wanted to see clean transportation and clean water, but. Um, you know, we, we here in Hawaii uh, have a total population of just over, I think, 1.2 million. So we're smaller than most of your cities in California in terms of population. So we don't have quite the budget that California does. But um, thanks to you and, and the folks that you work with, we certainly tap into all the standards and all of the uh, work that you've done in California to help um, us develop uh, our standards out here and stay consistent. Because you guys go international. I mean, when you start negotiating you know, standards and, and um, the, uh, the, the norms for stations and things. You, you're looking at Japan, you're looking at Europe uh, and trying to standardize the J2601 kind of stuff and make sure that we're all in line and that, that cars don't all have different fittings on them to take the hydrogen. So we appreciate the leadership that California has uh, provided consistently. I mean, while the rest of the, the federal government and a lot of the states, including Hawaii, kind of dropped off the hydrogen radar for a while, um, in the last eight years. Uh, California's been pretty consistent and we appreciate that leadership and your role in it. So thanks a lot for doing that. But what's kind of the latest in the stations that you've got going? How many stations are up? Uh, are you doing on-site electrolysis or your tube trailer? What are some of the things going on in California with the hydrogen stations? Yeah, so it's, it's really exciting. We ended the year at, with 26 open retail stations. Um, so. The last one that we opened was in San Diego and Del Mar, um, so that, that's really exciting. So essentially now we have, for those who are familiar with our geography, you could drive you know, between San Diego, we have a cluster of stations in Orange County and, and Los Angeles, um, and there's a connector station, well actually in Santa Barbara there's a station as well, so it's very easy to go up there for the weekend from LA or Orange County. And then we have on Interstate 5, which connects our northern and southern California population clusters, we have a the Colinga, the Harris Ranch station there as well. And so from there, you can drive into the Bay Area. We have a, a good cluster in the uh, Silicon Valley. We're um, going to build out the San Francisco region soon. Uh, we have the North Bay covered as well. There's a station in West Sacramento and then one up in Truckee in Lake Tahoe. So we've actually driven some fuel cell vehicles in Nevada. So we got some bi-state fuel cell vehicles. I was going to ask about Nevada and, you know, how, if you've got something on the way to Vegas, because I know that's a real popular route. And uh, getting interstate's going to be the very popular route. We've been talking about it a lot. We actually have an in competition. That's right. right. That's right. And I think we just um, finished with uh, applying for fast stack corridor designations. You know, working with a within California, but we're also talking about connecting up with Nevada, um, in Utah, and Colorado, and trying to connect our you know hydrogen and, and plug and charging uh, corridors. And I think that one of the important ones is get to Las Vegas. We can already we can do Reno now but uh, Las Vegas is a really important one and so these stations uh, are they production stations or are they mostly tube trailer or is there a good mix and is there a tendency to 
like one one way of doing it over another based on the cost or you know what are some of the factors in building these stations so right now we're seeing a lot on the delivered gas so you know a tube trailer would come up some of them have a do a drop and swap so that once it when a tube trailer gets low they'll come up and switch out for a new tube trailer um but a lot of the stations that are developed are actually kind of they have a, a receptacle so the the trailer um can do a milk run, so to speak, and they can okay. go out and top off stations with the deliveries. And so we're seeing that for the most part. We do have some electrolysis stations coming online. We'll have one up and running very soon in, in Riverside, actually on the city yard. Uh, that will be electrolysis. Um, Ontario is is very soon to, co to be completed as well, and also in Woodside, which is, um, for those of you who like plastic rock and stuff, it's uh, by Alice's Restaurant right across the street. Okay. Is there a preference? I mean, is there is there something driving the tube trailer thing? Is it just more convenient or for scale right now because the few vehicles that are out there, it's it's maybe it scales better that way? Or what are some of the decision yes. um, points in there? I mean, so far, it's just the lowest cost option. Okay. Um, it's, a, you know, we can skim off of centralized production. A lot of it's steam methane reformation of natural okay. gas. So we need to take water and, and natural gas. Um, that, uh, based on centralized production, so that's kind of the cheapest molecule. But we're working, you know, closely with the um, utilities and stuff to to figure out systems that will work uh, to make electrolysis pathway more cost effective. And it's it is you know we can it's manageable now, but we can do a lot better with the with the tractive rate structures. And we're starting to you know very excited about um, you know as our renewables uh, grow and our grid. I think we're getting close to twenty seven percent, if I'm not mistaken, on our renewable portfolio standard. Um, but as we get more and more online, uh, more of that excess energy is, you know, there's certain times of the day or certain seasons where it needs to be curtailed. And so hydrogen is a great place to store that extra energy. That's an important point. And it's a point that I, I tend to really push hard over here is that um, as we electrify our transportation sector, that's going to drive our electrical requirements higher overall in the state. And we don't have all the hydroelectric like you do in the, on the west there. Uh, that you can pull uh, your renewable hydro power. Uh, so we, we have to look at a lot of that intermittent uh, solar and wind power. And for that, you got to have the storage and hydrogen complements the uh, transportation sector and also helps us electrify the transportation sector, uh, as well as take care of um, high production time when we don't have the demand for electricity. We can use that intermittent solar and intermittent wind to start making hydrogen and then use the hydrogen in the stationary fuel cells um, later on in the evening. In fact, Zuri, why don't we bring up a couple, the first two pictures. We'll, we'll just talk about them and, and just do them really quick. Um, the first one, this one here is uh, actually one of those stationary fuel cells at the Toyota headquarters in California at Torrance. And it's a one megawatt fuel cell that they use for what we call peak shaving. Um, when the electricity is really expensive in the summertime in California, They'll fire this thing up and run it off of the hydrogen line that runs right down the street between the, the Lindy Gas Company and one of the refineries. And they make uh, all their electricity required in their headquarters off that stationary fuel cell. So just to show you the scalability, that's a one megawatt fuel cell. And the next photo is one that we actually use in our vehicles. That's just a small 30 kilowatt a hydrogenics fuel cell, which is typical in, the, in a vehicle. So that's, that's how you make the electricity with these fuel cells, and it's really kind of neat. And, and like you say, um, the hydrogen, the more intermittent re renewables you've got, the more important it is to really look at that hydrogen as a storage option. So we're, we're going to focus on that and, and try and make a big push for our electric company to understand that they have a new potential business model if they start looking at the transportation sector as well. So we're going to take a quick break here, um, Tyson, and we'll be back in about 60 seconds. And, Learn more about what's going on in California. Hi, this is uh, Jane Sugimura. I'm the co-host for Condo Insider. And we're on Think Tech Hawaii every Thursday at 3 o'clock. And we're here to talk about uh, condominium living and uh, issues that affect condominium residents and owners. And I hope you'll join us every week on Thursday. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel, and with Ray Starling, I host Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, 4 o'clock every Wednesday, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, making discovery of what's going on in energy in this community. Ray, what do you think? We've got a great group of shows coming up, uh, finishing out this year and starting next year. Uh, Dean Nishida has been with us today. Uh, he's the new consumer advocate, and uh, 
he has told us a lot, but he's got a lot more to tell. So we're going to have him back and others like him in future shows. And Dean, how much of that do you agree with? There's a lot to be said, and I'm interested in seeing some of your other shows. Okay, we'll be back 4 o'clock every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii. Hey, that. welcome back to Stan the Energy Man on my lunch hour as usual here on Friday afternoon. So thanks for being here with us at Think Tech Hawaii. We've got Tyson Ackerley from California, works in the executive branch over there in a really unique position, which we're hoping to maybe duplicate here in Hawaii, um, where he just kind of helps, um, I'd say, smooth the way, especially on the permitting side and, and maybe when people have technical questions about standing up hydrogen stations in, in their vicinity. Um, to help move those projects along and, and make sure that things just don't get stuck in, in the bureaucracy. So again, welcome Tyson. Thanks for being with us today via Skype. And um, we're going to throw up a couple more pictures here. And, and um, they're mostly uh, stations and stuff that's, that's in California. So, sir, why don't we throw up some more of these pictures. And there's, there's a hydrogen bus that uh, I didn't get to ride on, but I, I talked to some folks. Um, this is up at, at Berkeley. Uh, that would actually wait for the hydrogen bus to come by because it was so much quieter and, and more comfortable to ride in um, than the diesel buses. So that's one of the things that California is doing is there, some of their metropolitan areas are looking at zero emission and hydrogen buses and other hybrid technologies uh, to, to clean up the transportation sector. And then we can just flash through the other ones. There's, already the, there's a bunch of stations. This one is in Torrance. Um, and then the next picture is actually the, the dispensing area. Is it Irvine, uh, UH, I mean, University of California, Irvine, that has a hydrogen station, Tyson? Yes, yeah, so Irvine has a hydrogen station. They're using that kind of in a unique way. They have, um, they do have the anteater bus, which is one of them is running as a hydrogen fuel cell electric bus. And so they fill it during the night. It's a light duty station, not designed for heavy duty use, but we, we want to get the bus down there. And so the, in the evening time, they do the feelings of that bus and also the one that Orange County Transit Authority has. And then during the daytime, it fills uh, light duty vehicles. Okay. Do they actually sell the hydrogen? They do. It's a re open retail station. And that's one of the most unique things about California's network is all the stations that we're opening now, the 26 I mentioned before, um, they all sell fuel um, via credit card to retail consumers. And that's unique anywhere in the world. I mean, uh, Germany is, is a non-retail, even though it's, it's a similar feel, look and feel. They're not actually customers directly paying for the fuel. Okay. Um, is the government Japan subsidizing it in Europe, or is it, uh, it I mean, is, they're just not charging, they're giving the fuel away for free? I think in some of the, in some cases, um, in some cases, the, there's a cross subsidy. It's a, a partnership between the automakers and the station providers. Um, okay. So they're kind of they're considering like a pre commercial type of a thing. And this, you know, we're, okay. Um, in California, it's an open re but it can can buy the fuel if they have a receptacle, which is a car. What in California? What is the cost for a kilogram of hydrogen? Just out of curiosity. So right now, it's. You know, on average, it's probably 12 to $14 per kilogram. So it's on the higher side. We um, definitely want to get that lower. But then the saving grace has been the automakers have been picking up um, the the tab on fuel. And so that, you know, that 12 to $15 a kilogram is, you can know, divide that by two or three to get, you know, kind of the equivalent for a gasoline price. So, you know, you're looking at, at uh, you know, around six, six to seven or, you know, Five to six dollars, depending on uh, equivalent gasoline price. But as I said, the automakers have picked it up. Um, I think with Toyota, with the lease, you get fifteen thousand dollars for the first three years of fuel, and we'll see what happens as they extend that in. So uh, we're, we're definitely very mindful of the price. Yeah, in Hawaii, uh, that that twelve dollars a kilogram. Actually, we did um, some Sandia National Labs math with uh, with those engineers, and um, sure. at a, at one point in time, gasoline was you know, right under five bucks a gallon here. And when we threw in the, uh, threw the, the um, formula together, uh, it came out to around 12 or so dollars a kilogram, which pretty much was right in the ballpark with what we were paying for, uh, for gasoline out here. It was, it was almost equivalent. And so if you throw in the, the um, mini mart uh, concept of, uh, you know, running a business that makes its money off of the retail sales in a store, and uh, now you're right in the ballpark where a company can actually make money uh, dispensing hydrogen and selling it at like 12 to $15 a kilogram 
uh, because they're right there almost with the, uh, the retail on gasoline. But also the technology, I mean, I know you see it too, the technology is getting better and better, and the more volume you do, the price drops. So I'm looking at uh, hydrogen getting substantially cheaper over the next five or ten years uh, as more and more cars come on the road. You're looking at the same thing? Absolutely, and that's the nice part. The cost reduction isn't up, it's, it's down. So it's just a, it's a supply and demand. And so as we get more throughput, the price will come down. And I think every study I've seen has shown that. And so we're looking at you know, potentially very attractive price of fuel once we get over that kind of the, this valley of death. Right now it's hard because the, you know, there's a relatively few number of stations. Um, we don't have the economies of scale and, and you know, relatively low volume throughput. Uh, right now we have about just over a thousand fuel cell vehicles on the road in California, which is a big deal, um, but we still need a lot more than that to drive the price down. Are they, they're primarily the Toyota Mirai and the Hyundai? That's right. So we have Toyota Mirai is the lion's share of that. Then we have the Hyundai Tucson. And then also just, uh, I think a few weeks ago, they got the first uh, brand new Honda Clarities on the road. I think there's about 10 of them out right now, but they're, they're ramping up very quickly. Great. I don't know if you know this, but we actually have six uh, Mirai in Hawaii. And, I uh, saw that. That's, that's great. Yeah. And that leads us to the point of, I, I named this, the title of this segment um, to Zev or not to Zev, because you guys are a zero emission vehicle state. And Hawaii made the decision not to do the ZEV um, mandate. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because you guys are really pushing ahead, but, you know, we're not ZEV, but we're trying really hard to stay up, stay up with you in terms of making things happen quick. We're at a much smaller scale, so I, I, I see that as a big advantage on our side. Um, but I want to let people know that's where the title came from, ZEV or not ZEV. California is a ZEV state and gets priority on vehicles uh, in a lot of cases because... The car companies get credits for emission-free uh, vehicles or lower emission vehicles, and that allows them to sell higher emission vehicles. Um, you know, more of those in the state too. So, uh, it's it's an interesting concept. But Hawaii is kind of on the other end, where we're just looking for people doing the right thing and and um, hopefully getting some business involvement in that uh, that says, hey, we just want to do this because it's the right thing for our environment and, and Hawaii. But is yeah. there, are there are there a lot of advantages to being a ZEV state that maybe Hawaii ought to relook at that model? I think it'd be great if Hawaii relooked at that model. Um, we're trying to get this as far and wide as possible, and the more pressure we have on automakers to deliver zero emission vehicles, the more they'll bring to market. So, as they're making for fuel cells, for example, as they're you know making investment decisions on how many Mirai to produce, how many Clarities to produce. You know, they're looking at our network and they have to make those, a lot of decisions, you know, three years in advance. There's a network that's developed in Hawaii and in California and in the Northeast, or, you know, it's all the North American market. It's a much more safe investment decision for the automakers to make. And so I think we find that to be very important. Um, but, you know, we see Hawaii in particular is just a, it's a tremendous uh, opportunity there. All the exposure and the travelers who come there and, Imagine renting a car that's a you know fuel cell vehicle when you get there, or a, or a plug-in electric, any, any zero emission drivetrain. It exposes the public to that, and okay. the ability you know think, think about your island in Oahu. You know, three or four or five stations can really cover the island, and that's that's true, especially that's as we first get started. Opportunity yeah. there. Yeah, until we get a lot of vehicles on the road, just a handful of stations can cover it, and that's what we're trying to do. And speaking of uh, the tourist side of it. One of the other projects I didn't mention to you earlier when we were talking off air was um, the Department of Transportation is initiating a uh, rental car uh, bus shuttle program where instead of each rental car company bringing their own buses in, the state is going to contract it out. And they've already committed to make nine of their 40-foot buses fuel cell buses. I'm supposed to help them build a station. And um, so one of the first things that anybody that that comes into Hawaii to rent a car is going to get to do is ride on a hydrogen fuel cell bus. And I think right after that, we're going to try and get some of the car companies to bring in uh, Clarities and Marais and, and Hyundai uh, vehicles that are fuel cell. And I've even talked to Honda about actually doing kind of the whole package deal where you do like an eco package thing where you come out here and, and uh, rent a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle and even do a little test track thing where they have a test track where you can kind of max perform the thing for a couple hours and then rent the vehicle and drive around in it. Uh, Cause we do a lot of good package deals on for vacations out here and we thought it'd be good. But you're right, this is a great place for the world to see hydrogen. 
and uh, we're going to try and, and maximize that potential as well. No, that's great. And I love that idea. That sounds really fun, like the ecotourism in a zero emission vehicle. That's exactly. We do a lot of great ecotourism out here because, you know, the other advantage Hawaii has is its natural beauty and the, the propensity that our local population has for keeping things uh, clean and, and natural and um, unpolluted and, and as culturally sound as possible um, to, to meet with the Hawaiian values that we've always had here in the islands to kind of cherish the land and the water and all the resources that we have. So it, it actually is a lot easier for us to sell that um, here in Hawaii because uh, it's kind of naturally built into the culture. It's great. So what are some of the, what, what are the things that uh, you see happening to get the other Zev states between the Northeast and, uh, and there in California connected? I mean, there's a whole lot of non-Zev states between you and uh, and Connecticut. I mean, uh, what, what are some of, uh, what's the big plan to bring the rest of the folks in there so you could actually drive your Clarity or your Mirai to New York City sometime from California? It's a great question. I mean, really the ZEB regulation is meant to be a floor and not a ceiling. So it's, it's meant to start the market. So you're noticing companies that are bringing zero emission vehicles and that there are 50 state vehicles, right? So they're not just selling them in ZEV states. And that's part of the exciting, exciting part. So like the Chevy Bolt, the Bolt EV coming out, for example, that's a 50 state vehicle and will be available across the country. Same with the Bolt with the V. Um, and that's, you know, they're just a few years ahead of where hydrogen is. And hydrogen's different because you can't just plug it in at home, so to speak, right? We need to have a fleet fueling network. And so we're working with the Northeast states. Um, Toyota has partnered with Air Liquide in the in the Northeast, or maybe it's the other way around there, the key is partner with Toyota to build 12 stations out there. And so we're supporting that effort, um, you know, with information and everything. But I think really um, we have to kind of create these beachheads of activity, you know, so if, like Hawaii, I see as one, California for sure, the Northeast states. Um, and then, then it's really, you know, once we prove that, and, and I think that we've, California's proven that you can do this, it is, and it, it is scalable, and, system, and now it's just developing those next markets. And then you can imagine as the Northeast expands, um, it's very easy to get into Quebec with Canada. Um, Canada has a, a new ZEV program that they're implementing. Um, same thing on this West Coast, you know, with uh, Oregon as a ZEV stage, and then you get into Washington, and, and British Columbia is making a push on the fuel cell vehicles. And I think it's just, you know, with each step, we just kind of reach a little bit further. You know, we get Las Vegas from, from California to then Reno. And then you, it's not that far of a stretch to get into the neighboring, you know, Utah uh, to make that happen. And so well, I, um, I, ideally I we, we get can, this to where it's I hope we can keep that momentum going, um, Tyson, because obviously the stuff that you, you guys are doing in California is really leading the way. And we thank you again for your leadership over there. Believe it or not, we're, we're up against our stop time here and uh, we've got to sign off. But I want to thank you for being on Think Tech with us and giving us an update in California. And, and I hope that uh, you can come back on another six months or so and give us another update and uh, tell us how much farther you're reaching into Nevada with your hydrogen clause and get those guys over there to start selling some of your vehicles from California. I know that will be a big step too. But thanks again for being on the show with us and for everyone else out there in Think Tech land, we'll see you next Friday on...